So the big question is, is this the same as a superconducting gap or is it different? So we will try to uh, examine that question. Um, okay. So the first thing we can say is that the, if we plot the gap, the pseudo gap, as a temperature scale, it, it uh, I mean, it, and, I mean, sorry, the pseudo gap we only know as a, we, if we know as, as a temperature scale, and compared to the superconducting gap, also in the units of temperature, one is just scales like the other. So everything scales with this energy scale, not with the actual PC, which is going down. This gap is increasing, this gap is increasing proportional to, to this one, but PC is dropping. So these things look like to us at the beginning that perhaps the pseudo gap is, uh, the sample is getting ready to become a superconductor. There's some pairing happening. Uh, now, of course, uh, many people don't agree with this uh, story, and they think it's a different thing. But uh, Juan Ong in Princeton did this amazing experiment. He took a crystal of IPC and put it on a very thin uh, spring, a silicon spring, okay? And uh, put a magnetic field, and that, that bends the spring because there's a torque, okay? Uh, and so the torque bends the magnetic field. And you can tell if the sample is uh, magnetic, ferromagnetic, or diamagnetic, or whatever it is, or non-magnetic. So the idea is to look for diamagnetism, which is a signature of superconductivity. So this is the arrangement. It's a silicon, very thin silicon. And here's a capacitor to measure uh, the, 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 the deflection here. And it's very sensitive, 5 times 10 to the minus 9. You have at 10 tesla. OK, so this is a result. And it's really amazing, because at high temperatures, in the normal state, you see it's just uh, totally non-magnetic non or paramagnetic. Then as soon as you go below DC, then the susceptibility drops. It becomes less than uh, quadratic here. Less than parabolic, sorry. And then it keeps dropping, and it becomes actually completely diamagnetic. Well, this is already in the superconducting state, but long before superconductivity, this effect uh, occurs. And so um, it's really also a signature that perhaps in the pseudogap there are little regions of superconductivity, but it's not uh, the whole sample. Only at TC, the whole sample comes in. So let's look at uh, some other effects then. So we try to understand what is the connection between the pseudo gap and the superconducting gap. Now we cannot study this because if we lower the temperature, superconductivity comes in. So we will try to understand uh, what the ground state is by going right around here to try to see what, what do we find at very low temperatures. So what would be the ground state if superconductivity was not there, because in photoemission we cannot kill superconductivity with a magnetic field. Okay. So uh, let's look at the momentum dependence of the gap. This is the superconducting gap. Okay, it's the data is symmetrized. So you can see that you go from maximum gap here to minimum gap along the, this is a copper oxygen bond direction, this is a diagonal. And you can see that here there's a, just a node. Okay, just one point node. Here already the spectrum is flat, meaning there is very small separation. Okay, now if we go to the pseudo gap state, this amazing thing happens. You have this gap at high temperatures in the pseudo gap regime, and then all of a sudden you have this arc, like a Fermi arc. Now you see that this is. Um, it's not as sharp as this, so it's not really quite a quasi-particle, but it's a well-defined excitation centered at zero energy, okay? So we know it's exactly at zero energy, and um, we want to understand this phenomenon. How does this work? Many people think that this is perhaps due to magnetism. So in magnetism, you would shift the, the anti-ferromagnetism. You 
shift the uh, Fermi surface to here, okay, and then you have an arc here. But that's not the case. That's not what happens. Okay. So let's uh, plot then. Here we plot the gap divided by the gap at zero temperature, both in the superconducting state. This is the D wave. This is a very under. This is an underdope sample. Oh, PC ninety kel optimal dope sample. But in the pseudo gap, the arc. As you see, the gap goes faster. And here's the arc. Okay, the Fermi arc. All right. Let's see how this evolves. Um, so here's with what happens with temperature. As you uh, increase the decrease the temperature, the arc becomes smaller. Okay. And as you increase the temperature, then the, the arc becomes larger, and eventually you have the whole Fermi surface. So uh, first, let me show you that this is really an arc, and it's different than uh, than uh, something than some gap. Question. Yes. Question. Sorry. What? Yes. Uh, what the size of the arcs? How the temperature? Say that again. A fixed W. Yes. The size of the arc? I will show you. I will show you. Okay. Okay. So this this is the data, the dispersion in the pseudo gap state, and this is in the superconducting state. So let me first discuss the superconducting state. You see, here's a node. So their dispersion goes right up to the node to within our resolution. And as soon as you move away from the node, you can already start to see the effect of particle hole mixing. You see, so it's everywhere. You can see this bending back. Now here's a pseudo gap, and you see that the dispersion is just directly going through uh, the Fermi energy. There's no sign of bending. Only when you get to the pseudo gap, you start to see back bending, the same as here. Okay, exactly the same. So there's this big signature that there's some some mixing going on between maybe particles and holes, or particles and particles. We can't tell. But certainly, this is just going straight through the Fermi surface. This is not an arc, because then we would have the same thing here everywhere. Okay, so let me show you in a different view. Uh, this is a three-dimensional picture of the representation of the uh, representation of the dispersion, energy, momentum, in two directions. So here, superconducting state. You can see that the gap opens right away, and you can always see. Uh, this back bending from particle hole mixing. Now in the pseudo gap, I'm sorry the data is not as good, but at the node the data is just going straight up, okay, dispersing as fast as here, and then all of a sudden the pseudo gap appears here, okay, and you can see it. Whatever it, the pseudo gap appears, even though it's not necessarily in the straight part of the Fermi surface, you see this back bending, and this momentum is always a Fermi momentum. So we think it's not due to some charge order, it's something else, okay? It's tied to the Fermi surface, always. Okay, so let's see how it evolves with doping. So as we uh, decrease the doping, the Fermi arcs get shorter. They, they become smaller and smaller. So we're trying to go down to low doping to, uh, as TC goes down. You see here, you have TC90, and you have a long arc. TC25 Kelvin, and it's a shorter arc, okay? And we have many samples in between. So let me compare the, just a contrast of underdope with overdose. So remember, in, in um, overdose, we have uh, the gap continuously decreasing, like in BCS, all right, uh, here, continuously. But in overdope, near the anti-node, it's just constant, right? It doesn't decrease at all. It just fills in, like a bathtub, okay? And only when you go to high temperatures, you recover the, the uh, uh, excitations at zero energy. Okay. Now, we, let's define another quantity, which is um, the intensity of the gap at zero energy, because this is not enough to describe everything. You also need to know uh, how much spectral weight you have lost, okay? You can't just talk exactly about the gap. So we define this quantity L, which is just the distance from here to here. So there's no theory, 
is very simple. Very, very simple definition of the loss of spectral weight. The distance between here and here, one minus that. Okay? And um, so when, when the pseudo gap is, is, uh, is large, F is, uh, uh, then L will be, uh, will be large. Okay? And when it's gapless, L will be zero. So that's the meaning of this. So here's L, and you also see the effect of the pseudo gap here and the arcs. Okay, so we're now plotting the loss of spectral weight at zero energy. Okay, oh well, as a, as a function of angle. And you can see here's a pseudo gap. I mean the, right. And here's the arc, no loss of spectral weight. And you can see as a function of temperature, okay, and doping, we have both, temperature and doping, uh, this is all the data here. <coughs> okay. But, so let me t show you some more. Um, this is actually the value of the gap. It says here we fit, but you can just look by eye. Yes? Somebody had a question? Yeah. Yes? Uh, just uh, how do you normalize the, the data? The data. Um, this data is just normalized to very high energy, to around 1 eV or so. It's not the best way, actually, but I can tell you later some details of a better way to do it. Okay, so um, here is the arc. Now, here in the paper, when we publish this, we fit this to find the arc, the, the gap, but it's not necessary. You can just measure with a ruler here. It's very easy. Okay, so we get a T star from our bits by checking where does this uh, spectral weight comes back to um, to uh, zero, L becomes zero. So there's many measures of how big the pseudo gap is. You can measure uh, the pseudo gap with respect to the superconducting gap. You can measure when L goes to zero, uh, and, and you can do some fits. At what angle does it go to zero? At what angle? L is a function of angle. So yes, that's right. That's and when the, when the whole thing is zero. The whole thing. Well, no, at a certain point, the pseudo gap disappears, L will be zero. <coughs> so it's as a function of angle. And so, for example, because the reason we do this is because some very underdog samples, you cannot warm up to, you know, over room temperature. The sample will be destroyed. So then we have to guess where the pseudo gap is, what the energy scale is. And the way we do it is by plotting L as a function of temperature, you know, you extrapolate. Or you can look at this energy scale here. They both give the same result. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? And this is L at one angle. Uh, this is L at the antinode, but it could be at any angle. Well, I will show you the angular dependence. Okay, just a moment. That's important. So when we can't reach T, uh, T star, we just extrapolate. See, it just goes linearly up to T star. Or we can read it here, the same result. That's to find out how big the uh, pseudo gap is. So once we put all of this together, we find that there's a complete scaling of the gap as a function of temperature if we scale to this quantity, T over T star. That's the only energy scale in the problem. It's not TC. TC doesn't matter. So here it is. The thing is you have two or three samples here which have very different TCs, but I mean very different uh, T star by a factor of two, they're measured at, um, what is this? this? This is T star, this is a temperature at which they were measured, okay? And this is a reduced temperature, this. So all of these samples, very different doping, same little t, and they scale the same, okay? They just go exactly the same, the gap is identical. We cannot put all the data here because you, you won't be able to see it. Here's another example with a different little t, two samples which are again different t star, different t c, uh, but the same little t, and they also scale together. So at any temperature, it doesn't matter what the temperature in the doping is, the only quantity that matters is this little t, and that's it, okay? So it really is true scaling, not just on the arc length, but the whole gap, the entire gap. So it seems to us, and the energy scale is T star. So this is not some energy, other energy scale. It's not some other ordering phenomena. This is the same ordering phenomena 
as superconductivity because superconductivity also scales with d star, right? I mean the gap in superconductivity. We're talking about the gap here. This is a gap. Okay. So that's the only relevant energy scale, which was a surprise to us because why should that be? You know, why isn't TC an energy scale? Well, we don't know the answer, but the, the data is there. So let me show you in more detail what this looks like for all our, our, data, all our samples. So here you are. This is uh, little t, t over t star, and versus Fermi arc length, you can see what's happening. It's just extrapolating linearly, and we have a lot of data, and, and this is pretty small, 0 0.1, and then you can just extrapolate, and you see that at zero, um, zero, at the limit of zero T over T star, very low temperature compared to the pseudo gap, this will be a point, it will be a node. So you can think that um, if we could reach zero, we would have a nodal metal. What does that mean? It means a metal which has a gap just like a superconductor. It's the same. Okay, in fact, the gap, once you, once you get down into the very low temperatures, it looks always, I will show you the data, always like this, same spectrum. So at, in the limit of t equal, uh, little t equals zero, you just have one Fermi point. So that's really an unusual state of matter. Very, very strange. Now, this is allowed. Remember, I told you about Volovic, who did a study of what uh, topologies were allowed um, by, by basic considerations in field theory for the Fermi surface. Now, points are allowed. Four points is allowed, and a continuous Fermi surface is allowed. Arcs are not allowed. So arcs are only an effect of finite temperature. Okay, so why, why they happen, we don't know, but I will show you more. Okay, so this is really uh, quite interesting uh, because it also points out to the fact that you could think of superconductivity as being basically this energy spectrum plus coherence, phase coherence, where all the pairs are, uh, are in phase. So first everything pairs in the pseudo-gap state, then it becomes coherent, and you have superconductivity. It all points to this. The Nernst effect, the, um, which I did not talk about, the diamagnetism, the gap, scaling, all of these things. Um, so let's look at the, huh? um, So in this presumed nodal metal, is it somehow, I guess it, it reminds me of graphene. The yeah. Those nodes are, so right. The two nodes you have in, uh, right. in graphene. So, uh, are there distinct features of graphene known that you would expect for this node method? That you would not expect, let's say, in a regular method? Well, it would be nice if we could find a quantum hole effect, but you know, I don't know. I, would, I don't know how to do those experiments. And, and you have to go to a very low temperature, right? So, you really need to be uh, just below the finite PC. But that would be a definite proof, right? Okay, uh, so here is a, uh, we want to know, is this arc just a temperature effect? Namely, is it just that when the gap is small, the electrons can jump over the, or the pairs can jump over the gap and cancel the gap? Okay, now this is a, uh, so the answer is no, it's not like that. Oh, I don't know why this was first. Let me show you here, let's start here. Here's at high temperatures, okay? And you have this arc, long arc here. Okay. Now let's let's drop the temperature. This is a very underdog sample. Okay. Um, so this is 115, 90 Kelvin, still arc shorter, but still there. And then all of a sudden, just below the C, bang, exactly D wave. Okay. Exactly D wave. So. At TC, the arcs just collapse. It doesn't matter how long they are, exactly at TC, they disappear. So this is, the arcs are not just uh, because the electrons are jumping across here and canceling the arc. It's not that. It's not a thermal effect. It's just some other effect, which we don't understand. But exactly at TC, just below TC, the arcs just collapse, okay? This is, a, I think this is something like five degrees below TC. 
And, and you have exactly the D wave that you have at uh, very low temperatures. So the, uh, the, that's the another interesting thing. In the uh, pseudo-gap state, uh, no, in the superconducting state, the, R, the, the gap size is independent of temperature. That's not like BCS. So the gap stays exactly the same size up to uh, PC, and then disappears because there's an R. Okay? So it's a very, very different than BCS. You cannot use the same ideas. It doesn't work. Okay, uh, so here, in fact, is uh, the gap as a function of uh, temperature, okay, for uh, different samples, TC67, TC80. We now have a very undergo sample, TC35 uh, Kelvin, same story, okay? So you see that um, it's always a D wave. When, when you, uh, if, okay, so this is very uh, low in, no, very high in temperature, right? So it's, it has an arc, but in the superconducting state, it doesn't matter. You can be right up to PC, and you will see that it's always a D wave. And then exactly at PC, the arc appears. So uh, it's a very unusual thing. So we have two things. The arc scales with temperature, with T over T star, and that's the only energy scale. And in the superconducting state, there's no sign of temperature really, other than maybe the filling of the gap, L. But the size of the gap is fixed. It's just a D wave. Okay? That, that's interesting. All right, so here, in fact, we want to know how fast does it collapse. So here we're plotting. That's the other curve I show you. This is a pseudo-gap state. So uh, we, you take, uh, then you see the collapse here, these points. We also measure the resistivity here. And we can find that the, the collapse of the arc, the width and temperature, is just given by the width in the transition. That's the only reason we put the resistivity here, because the collapse of the arc is just given by the width of the uh, superconducting transition. There is no other, uh, there is no other, the temperature is not a factor. Okay, it's just, this is just sample quality, basically. Now, I have to remember, this is T over T star, so it's not the usual graph that you see for resistivity. But you can see that this phenomenon then is because of superconductivity somehow destroys the arc. It, it creates phase coherence, phase stiffness. So in the, immediately you have a D-wave uh, superconductor. Okay, so that's the story of the pseudo gap. So now let me compare our measurements to other uh, techniques. So let, we, we start because we're measuring the, the imaginary part of the Green's function. Our data, A of k and omega, is the imaginary part of the Green's function. And if you know that, you should be able to, to compare to other, other techniques. And I will try to show you how we do this. OK. So first, let's look at heat transport. What is that? Sorry. Uh, Okay, now this is the spectrum, and there are two quantities that matter here. The slope of the gap along the Fermi arc, that's V delta, and the slope of the dispersion perpendicular to that, from the, the you know, how fast this disperses. So those two quantities give you this spectrum. And it's very simple, so if you ask me, it's like graphene, the answer is, in this respect, yes, okay? It is like graphene because this is the entire, this determines everything, all the quantities. I will show you how. If you, if you uh, assume this spectrum, which we measure, so we measure the ratio, we, we measure independently V2 and V delta. And Louis Typher in uh, Canada uh, measures the heat conductivity, okay, kappa, divided by T. And you see that this quantity just, uh, goes like this number, Vf over V2. So they also measure this ratio directly by heat conductivity. Okay? And in fact, we were not the first people to mention a nodal metal. They did it first because you can see that at, for low temperatures here, for uh, very low temperatures, this is just linear. 
completely linear, even if you are just below uh, a sample which is below TC. It's not superconducting. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not superconducting. The, the heat transport is still linear. Okay? So they decide, they already they call this a nodal metal because the heat conductivity is given by that quantity. All right? It's, it's really linear. A high temperature, of course, the spectrum does something else, so you can't tell. Okay, so this ratio they found for BISCO is 19. Of course, we had measured this ratio a long time ago, and it's also the same with an error bars, okay? So this is, this is a definitely a bulk probe. There's no question about it. And it goes down to very low temperatures. They go down to, I think, uh, 50 millikelvin, I think, down here. And you see this thing really works very well. Completely different measurement, completely different quantity, physical quantity. It all works together. Okay. Uh, you can look at other things. Oh, sorry, I didn't do it right. You can look at the specific heat. You see the specific heat, these are all constants, right? This is 1.3 roughly, uh, KV, H bar. This N over D is the number of layers per unit cell, okay? This is the temperature, and this is V2 uh, over, VF, V2 again. So this is what you get from specific heat, from heat transport. You get the same from Argus, okay? Um, the, you can also look at the lambda flow correction. So when the particle moves, Right, this, the, the, the liquid has to go around it in a Fermi liquid, right? Just like a boat. When the boat goes away, the water has to flow around it. So there's an F10 correction to the, um, that Landau introduced. Um, and so you can actually calculate that because it's actually related. This, uh, this is a superfluid density. So this is related to a superfluid density. The superfluid density divided by the mass it's just Vf over V2 times this quantity, which is this Landau correction. I don't know why they call it alpha. Everybody else calls it F10, I think, um, because it's a dipolar component. So um, this quantity, you can calculate if you compare this number to the superfluid density. They get this quantity, this value, and here you have we have more errors. There's more errors here, so. It's not that close, but it's not, you know, crazy. It's somewhat similar. Okay, but this is harder because you're comparing to something else, some other measurement, okay? And so now let's look at a neutral scattering. A question. Hmm? Yes? The yeah. blue end is the reduction of the, it's different between the superfluid and the normal end. Uh, right. And T. Uh, at certain T, at T equals zero, certain other T, yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a really, uh, there's not much agreement in the literature. That's a problem. So that number depends exactly on, but, you know, more or less within some error bar. Uh -huh. And I heard it said that, that uh, this coefficient doesn't depend on doping. Right, that number doesn't depend on doping. That's correct. Because that's, that's really a property of the normal state, if you like. It's, it's just a, the, when the electrons flow in the, you, you have to push away, uh, around the quasi-particles, not the superfluid, that's just super, <coughs> super, super fluid. <laughs> that moves along, so it's just a normal state. So, well, that's not obvious, actually, you're right. It's not obvious why that should be. I don't understand. So, okay, sorry. so let's look at neutral scattering. And again, Another we question. can, sorry, what? Sorry, Edna. Yes? So, how do you extract alpha from the RPS data? <laughs> we measure V2 over, uh, from which data? From the from data? data? Yeah, the you, just um, you just measure V2 and Vf, the slope of the gap uh, of the dispersion on the, along the Fermi surface and perpendicular, that's a ratio, V2 over Vf. And uh, then you put in that formula, you compare it to the reduction in superfluid density measured by other people, and you get alpha. Okay. There's no other parameter in there. And, and you claim that alpha is F01 from the Landau? Yeah, I think so. Okay, but anyway, whatever. <laughs> it's, a land up, it's a land up parameter for the for the node or quasi product. Right, right, right. Because the whole spectrum is controlled by this Dirac cone, right? That's the beauty here, that because the Dirac cone controls all the excitations, right? So everything uh, in terms of temperature behavior is controlled by the excitation between. 
uh, one side of the cone and the other, right? So that's why that is the determining factor. We're at low temperature, far away from the antinodal region. Now here, uh, we can compare neutrons to um, our best because, again, well, this is not so direct, okay? We make many assumptions here, but let me tell you what they are. So we measure this, the, the imaginary part of the Green's function as a function of k and omega, okay? And um, the problem is in superconductivity, you also have the anomalous Green's function. Right? This is what, in fact, gives you superconductivity. Right? This is just a normal state. Uh, so what we measure is a mixture of those two, but we don't know how much is this, in a sense. Except that, it's used, in BCS at least, this one is a multiple of the other. So, and, and uh, okay, so uh, let's, let me, let's go from that. And then these are just Fermi factors, right? The Fermi function at different energies, and this is the energy uh, at which you want to calculate the susceptibility, and that's a formula for the bare susceptibility. Okay, this is in Mayan's book on many body physics. You can just look it up. Okay, so what we're talking about is an excitation that would take an electron from this sheet of the Fermi surface to there and back. That's what this susceptibility really is measuring, right? Well, how easy is it to excite an electron from here to there and back? Okay. So, before we can do the comparison, we need to do two things. You see, this is an integral over energy, you know, in principle, if you want the complete susceptibility, it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, we can't do that. But if you stop at some temperature, you're just concerned with what happens below that temperature, right? We're just interested in the low energy scales. We can't say anything about the higher energy scales. Only neutron scattering or some other measurement can do that. So to find the empty part of the spectrum, we have to symmetrize this trick I showed you before. Now we're justified to do that in the superconducting state because at least within the gap energy or twice the gap energy, the spectrum is symmetric, right? We know that A of K omega is minus A of K and omega. That we know. It turns out that in the pseudo-gap, it's also true. The same energy scale occurs in the pseudo-gap. It's totally symmetric, okay? So at least within this energy scale, the, the gap energy, twice the gap energy from, from, from here to here, you can, you can uh, believe this, 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 uh, simply this assumption that we're making. And the next assumption is we have to uh, figure what that is, but we just make it a, a multiple of uh, the normal Green's function. Okay, that's all we can do. And here's a result for the bare susceptibility. Sorry, do you say that again? What do you oh. make multiple of the, you make F multiple of G? Of G, right. Why? Because in DCS that's what happens, but that's all we can say. So it depends what you're calculating. If you're gonna calculate optical conductivity, then it's very difficult because it depends on the difference of f and g, right? So it's very sensitive to exactly the value of, of f. But if you're going to calculate susceptibility, it's only the sum. So whether you have a factor of two, you can't really tell. It doesn't really matter. I'll show you how we compare in the end, is how we have some confidence that that's correct. Is but, f proportional to the size of the gap? Uh, it's proportional to the Griggs function. The, the enormous part of the function. Yeah, the imaginary, yes. The anomalous part is proportional to the normal part. In BCS theory, okay? Um, we don't really know what it is. There's no way for us to measure that. But, so we make that assumption. So if we're not gonna compare to optical conductivity where you take F minus G or G minus F, which makes a change between two small numbers very complicated, here we just add them together, so it's okay. Uh, so let's look at it. So here's our result. So this is, uh, remember, oh sorry, I, I should tell you, so this is a complex quantity, okay? Because once you multiply all of this, you get real and imaginary parts, okay? So this is a real part of this, is a, no, this is imaginary part, and this is a real part. And of course, so what do we do here? Um, you asked me about uh, normalization. So if we subtract the background, okay? and normalize the spectral function to one, 
It's just an arbitrary number. It's a strongly correlated system. It could be 0.5. It doesn't matter. It's some fixed number. So we normalize the integral of the spectrum to a constant. Okay? Then you can actually measure in states per EV per formula unit. You actually can calibrate your spectrum to an absolute value. And guess what? That's the same. These are the same numbers that you get by neutron scattering. Well, I'll show you later. Okay, so this is as a function of uh, the difference between the nodal node to node distance for the electron to jump and back and forth. So um, one is at the node, and then you make it, uh, or no, it's anti node to anti node, and then you make it shorter. So you're moving along the Fermi surface. Okay? So that's what this quantity is. How far is it from one sheet to another? Now, the imaginary part here you can see already that there's a gap in the uh, imaginary part of the susceptibility, okay? There's a gap, and then, of course, the susceptibility becomes large. So this is a spin gap that you see in neutron scattering, okay? Just the spin gap. And then when you go away from this uh, point, you see you lose this gap, and then eventually it comes back. So it's, it depends on the con geometrical conditions for the scattering. And this is the real part. And why do we want to do that? Because, uh, oh, so let me show you what happens in the pseudo-gap state. In the pseudo-gap state, you lose your spin gap, okay? It just disappears. Because we're taking a lot of data, this is many, many, many bits of data uh, over the whole brilliant zone, our signal to noise ratio is very good. So you can see that the, the spin gap disappear as soon as you cross DC, which is interesting. Um, okay, so here's a comparison of, um, so you, now we do not calculate the full susceptibility, so we have to make an approximation, which is the RPA. And here there are two things that you don't know, J, and you don't know if J, what is the dependence of J. In some papers, for example, Patrick Lee, they need to make this approximation to make the thing work. Um, we can try either way, this is just a, it is just a calculation. And when we do this, th this is what you get. So this is the susceptibility as a function of energy, okay? And you get this resonance. And as you vary this uh, scattering length, you can see what it's doing. Now we can calculate both with this quantity or just a constant J, okay? It turns out a constant J works better. It works quite well. Uh, if we put this in, it doesn't really work very well. I'll show you why. Now this is a comparison of the neutron data for BISCO from five years and, and our, our, our calculation, this, this quantity here. Okay, so it's not too bad. Um, all right, so now let me show you the, the uh, so this, if you take, you cannot see much from here, you only see the resonance, but to, it's hard to see the momentum dependence of the resonance. So what you have to do is take a cut at constant, uh, energy as a function of momentum, like the MDC for neutrons. And you get this this thing, which is what also the neutrons measure. Here it is. This is again BISCO from Pius, the same data. And you can see there's a great similarity. Now this is when you make J equals J times cosine Kx plus cosine Ky. This is if you just have constant. And you see to reproduce this upper branch, you just, you just leave uh, J constant. And so you have the low Okay, so this is the lower branch, hourglass. This is the upper branch, okay? Just like in neutrons. So it's a function of the scattering length here. Okay, and uh, uh, well, this is some new data from Resnick. I don't know if it's out here, but you can see this uh, plot, uh, which we also can do. But I, I dislike these plots because they're, you can, you know, by changing the color scale, you can do anything with these plots. You never believe these things. <laughs> Look at spectrum, you know, that's a real story. Okay, now let's compare ARPIS to STM. Um, now these two are very surface sensitive, STM even much more than ARPIS, but let's just see what we get. Um, so first let's look at the superconducting state. Okay. Um, there was this paper, but by McElroy, you know, from uh, uh, J.C. Davis group. You, you probably heard some about this from uh, Takagi already, where they find that 
Uh, if they look, there's a lot of interference patterns here. Or that's what they decided it was, some interference patterns. And then if you take a Fourier transform of this uh, constant, uh, this, this uh, it's not a topography, it's just a, a signature of a current, okay, without taking, you know, with ignoring the topography, so you're scanning a constant current. And uh, you take the Fourier transform and you find this pattern, there are points here, okay? And uh, SD, uh, this is from STM, you take the Fourier transform, you find this. And what you f so they proposed that, this is a proposition, that's what they said. They proposed that the phenomena is scattering again. <coughs> Remember, this is a spectrum in the superconducting state, right? It's a Bougainville spectrum, right? So um, if you if you uh, if you look at this as a function of energy, at the Fermi uh, point energy, you just have points, right? As you go down in energy, you're going down this cone, right? And you and so there's a there's a B. Uh, this this is because of the slope of the gap, and this is because of the slope of the dispersion. And so as you increase your your uh, energy below the point, you're moving away from the Dirac point, this gets bigger. They call this bananas, uh, which is a fine name for this. Um, and what they said is, so it's going to get bigger and bigger. What they said is that the phenomena that dominates this, this, the pattern comes from scattering from the high density of state points. Well, the turning points in the bananas here are, of course, the high density points. So you get scattering between these high density points, and that predicts what spots you're going to get in your um, STM measurement. Now, this 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 is a scattering mechanism. We're just measuring our base with basically imaginary G is just the density of states, right? The local density of states. Uh, but anyway, let me first show you the bananas because we can see those directly. We don't have to make assumption about that. You just plot your spectrum as a function of energy. Okay, so as you increase the uh, binding energy, you see you'll see these bananas, and you can already see the high density of space regions at the end of the bananas, right? So, so you can imagine that that these are going to produce those spots. So, huh? are these in the superconducting state? Yeah, this is in the superconducting state. It just increases the energy of your the binding energy. The binding energy. Right. <coughs> okay, so. I'm making this black because I want you to get used to the dark. Um, so here's how we, we can analyze the subtle features in this spectrum, try, try to compare it to STM and see if we can understand what's going on. Uh, and we do this because we measure imaginary G, so it's like local density of space. So we do an out of correlation, uh, density, density, out of correlation, uh, like this. And this we should be able to compare to what the STM is measuring. The Fourier transform is equivalent to this quantity, which is just multiplying the intensity at 1k, one energy, another k, another energy. This is easier than, than the uh, susceptibility because we, have to, we don't have to make any assumptions here. This is all measured. Okay? All right, let's look at it and see what happens. So this is a nodal point. You just see the four nodes. And you see these uh, dots here. Okay. Then, as you increase the binding energy, uh, this arc increases. I mean, this banana increases, and you can see there are now four points. I don't know if you can see. Probably it's difficult from there. It will get brighter, but I, I can see from here. Okay. Now you keep increasing the binding energy. Now you see these spots have, are di dispersing. They're moving out. Okay. And as I keep increasing, can you see anything there? It's very hard. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, now you can see. Can you see here? There are these points here. Okay, and so if I keep increasing the binding energy, you see those spots are changing. Okay? They're changing all the time. All right, now what they propose as a model is just the scattering from here to here, from here, here to there, and so on. And that produces all the spots. Okay. Now, we are not measuring scattering in, in, uh, in uh, our bits. We're just measuring the dense, local density of states okay? in K space. All right, so there's uh, 28 millivolts. You can see this pattern. 
All right, so these are the vectors. And in fact, all those spots are explained by all these vectors. Okay? And so, um, it looks like the octet model works, but it's misleading in some way, really. So let me compare our measurements here to the STM measurements of, of McElroy. So here are the vectors. I'm sorry you can't see the spots. It's not so good. Okay. So let me just take these things and move them over there. You can see that it's identical. It's the same story, exactly the same. And in fact, it's the same for all energies. Okay. So these spots are exactly the same as, or these spots are exactly the same as those. Now, to me, this looks just like a joint density of space effect. That's all really it, it seems to be. It, out of correlation of the joint density of space. So when you move one banana over another, you just plot that intensity and that's what you get here. Okay, so, so this always works. The problem with the octet model is that nobody knows how to calculate because people make very strong approximations. So if you want to calculate the scattering for one point, so G and then you have some scattering matrix D and then you go to another point, each one of those it's a complex number, and so when you multiply all that and you want to calculate, it's a, ho a horrible mess, so what they do is they throw away most of it and they say, if we take this, it works. Okay, maybe it does, but I don't know how you can throw away most of it. But anyway, if you just assume it's a joint density of space, that's okay also. Question. Yes? Uh, that uh, Fourier transform in the slide before, yeah. uh, I don't know, it seems not to me four fold symmetric. Uh, kind of it's more like twofold, right? Oh, um, the the uh, the SDM data. I understand what you're saying. For example, this point here is not there. It's not yeah. very strong. Is there an explanation? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I haven't noticed that before to tell you the truth. Because in fact, okay, so some spots might be missing, but I, I can show you. You can compare <laughs> other energies, and they're they're all there basically. But oh. So how strong is each part as a function of, it depends on the energy. Okay, so if I change the energy, you might get all the spots the same, or you might get them different, you know. It depends on the energy, when they interfere, and so I don't know what. Okay. Uh, so the monotonous sound, essentially the high energy excitations of the normal color particles. Right, correct. That's basically it. So here's a, the outer correlation, and you can look at the dispersion. So this is the node, and you're moving away from the node, and so on. And you can compare these, these numbers exactly to the FPM, and, and it works. But now it really gets interesting, because there was another paper by Yazdani, and they measured a pseudo-gap state, and they said these dots don't disperse. You get these extra dots here. I, I know they're hard to see. They're very hard to see. But he said you get these dots, and they don't change with energy. They stay constant. So they said, uh huh, pseudo gap charge order. Well, let's test that. We can just measure the photo emission in the pseudo gap state, right? So let's look at the uh, Fermi arcs in the pseudo gap state as a function of binding energy. Okay, and then let's calculate also the autocorrelation. So first let's look at this. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to change the binding energy in the pseudo-gap state. And what do you notice? You notice that in fact, they're not changing very much. Okay, in fact the arcs remain almost constant with binding energy. Right? Which was a real surprise. And the reason is because the pseudo-gap uh, the arc just goes very fast into the pseudo gap. So as you change binding energy, nothing much happens. It just stays fairly constant. And in fact, that's the reason why in the pseudo gap these things don't disperse because the joint density of states of this is just that it doesn't disperse. So you don't need to invoke uh, charge order. Huh? Yes. So when you go to the pseudo gap phase, yeah. are you going by raising temperature? Or are you going yeah. Under the no, by well, it's always the same under of sample, just by raising temperature. Yeah. Well, we did it for several samples, so. And would you see that even if uh, uh, 
if you have a sample that the dope is not enough to give you superconductivity? Ah, that's an interesting question. Okay, uh, I can tell you the answer. That's an unpublished result, but in principle, if you go to very little t, right, then the gap should be the uh, D wave line, and you should see dispersion. You do. If you go to very low, uh, uh, little t, you see dispersion, even in the pseudo gap state, right? So only when you have these big arcs, you don't see dispersion, because the gap just jumps at the end of the arcs. Okay, but it's all the same explanation. Everything is the same. So there are two vectors here. This vector and uh, where's the other vector? Well, this is not, well, there's the other vector. So in fact, yes, Danny only saw this vector first. So I, I remember telling him at a March meeting, hey, we also see this. They went back and looked here, and it's there. Okay. So it, it has even predicted power. Uh, so why do these remain constant and, oh, I took that slide out, uh, I'm sorry. So first of all, how do we know where these things come from? Well, we, we have this, the data, we can just deconstruct it, right? It's not, it's not like STM, you can't take it apart, but we can take it apart. So we can remove, for example, the nested part. So here the Fermi surface is straight. So some people say, oh, you should, you should get some scattering here which gives you uh, fixed uh, points that don't disperse. Well, for us it's easy, let's just chop those off. There's nothing non-dispersing here, okay? What do you get? Same story. Because it's coming from the end of the arc. It's not, this part doesn't play a role. In fact, these peaks have slightly different hue than these peaks, okay? You can actually see the two different. All right, so, so this effect is just the end of the arc. It's not the parallel straight parts of the Fermi surface. Um, so this is without, with the straight parts, this is without the straight parts, it's the same data. So we can just do all kinds of things. We can do the inverse. We can uh, remove the, I'm sorry, we can remove this part and leave the straight parts. That doesn't look at all like the, like the data, right? Completely different. So it's not scattering, it's not this vector here, that right? doesn't do anything. Okay. Or we can go to higher binding energy. I told you that, that this one vector is actually different than the end of the arcs. You can see here, okay, there's a curvy of curvature. So this is for binding energy uh, greater than the pseudo gap energy. There's a peak here, and this is binding energy less than the pseudo gap. So here, this vector is different than the vector uh, that you see in the pseudo gap because of the arcs at lower binding energy. So it all sort of kind of sit. Uh, it's not good to match me, all of this. Okay, so here's, it's amazing that here's the same sample. You just look below the, in the superconducting state, you see these bananas, and you see this <coughs> peaks here. In the pseudogap, you see these arcs, and you see these points, which is what the F STM was looking at. Okay? And what we do not see is any other effect of charge ordering, which namely would be a translation of the Fermi surface by this vector, like this. We never see anything like that. We look very carefully. We've never been able to find any, any, any uh, uh, ghost bands just from extra vec fixed vector. Everything is just QF, okay? All right. Ah, sorry. Yes? Why do you conclude that uh, this is not because of density? So because it's different, different Q vector. You see, if we go to, oh sorry, if we go to high binding energy, okay, much higher than, uh, then this part you can see it lights up, right? Yeah. So this vector here is shorter than the vector at lower energy, the so ones that uh, Danny used. If you go to high energy, then you can see the, this one. But, but this is not due to that. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, fine. Okay, at, if, you, if you look at some binding energy where you see only the R. Uh, let's look in here. Uh, so, oops, sorry. So if you're only looking at the R, so the binding energy is such that this part is not visible yet, okay? Then you see this effect, which is what was in this paper in science, right? 
And they uh, so, but other people, they did not. They were very careful not to suggest nesting here. They did not do that. They thought this was some ordering and some maybe the superfluid or something else. Okay, so they were careful enough not to call this nesting. Other people did that. But that doesn't work, that's what I'm saying. That's a different number than the one that you measure here or an SPM. Okay? Okay. Uh, so, oh, the other thing we can see is uh, if you look in the extended zone scheme, you can imagine you have 2KF scattering, right? Uh, which gives you something ra rather complicated in the end when you add up all the possible four directions. Hey, but so what? There it is. You can see the 2KF scattering. Okay. Before I was just showing you a small section here. If we look in the big scale here, for example, the 2KF Fermi surface. You can see it there. Okay. So it just looks. Everything is there. Okay. Actually, these pictures, uh, both the, the waves and this phenomena, were seen long before high TC by um, in SDM by. Um, uh, plumber, war plumber. He did it in metals, in copper, and things like that. So he, long ago, he already had all of this published. Okay. But it, it, what I'm saying, he only, he's the only one who published this 2KF, but it's, it's there also. Okay, I think um, I'm going to conclude here. I don't want to take too much time. So just some conclusion. So ARPES really provides unique information on the nature of the pseudo gap and in fact all the electronic excitations. And, and um, we do not have quasi particles in the pseudo gap because they're, they're, they're just aren't any. So you, you know, you, you cannot explain anything in the pseudo gap using a theory which is just a weak copy that just uses quasi particles. That is starting from the wrong point. Uh, so then we also find that the pseudo gap and Fermi are scale like T over T star, and that the ground state of the pseudo gap might be a nodal metal. We can't really prove that until we get there, but but S, uh, I mean thermal conductivity did get there, and they find the same thing. Okay. All right. So I presume it's correct. It's their idea. And perhaps we can think of the superconducting gap as a pseudo gap plus phase coherence, but this is this is an assumption, you know. It's not really a proof. I didn't prove that, just to make sure. Okay, thank you for your attention. In the thermal conductivity, right, the, the reason why you can claim that you can actually get sort of this uh, VF over V2 is that the effects of the impurities cancels out the, the, the change in uh, the, the increase in the uh, uh, scattering rate is decreased by an increase of the density of states at the, at the chemical potential. Since the lower well, you, you know the answer much better than I do because so, you worked on that, right? Right, yeah. But I don't, so, so I... I so I'm, I'm stating that. So, yeah. so then the, the question then becomes in the ARPES data, yes. can you see how the, how the, ga the increased density of states at the Fermi level uh, is changes uh, as a function of the impurity concentration at a particular Okay, that's a good question, but you see, uh, that what an impurity would do is change the line shape of the ARPA spectrum, right? But that's not what we're looking at. We're just looking at the gap value, right? So to look at the velocity, we're just looking at the gap value. So just the maximum, the peak, we don't care how broad it is. So we're just ignoring that part, okay? So I don't know the answer to your question. I mean, it would be interesting to do, but yeah, no, no. Any more questions? So, yeah. so I guess so I a different question. Sure. Um, maybe this is what you were saying about the, the 2KF scattering, but I, I didn't <coughs> quite get it. So were you saying that's the umclap scattering? Yeah, yeah, correct. Right. That's it. That's all it is. Umclap. Do you have a moment to go back to the slide on normal state uh, <coughs> density of states? Uh, which one is that? That was the one 
where you're comparing thermal conductivity with R. Oh, okay. Right. <coughs> okay. Let's try. Uh, it's just before this. Uh, this should be right here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which one? Yeah, yeah no, no, that was, I just wanted to um, ask you about that one more time. So, yeah. so the formula you have there is based on a, a Fermi liquid theory of the, of, of the supergrid that we see, Right. Basically. Right. Yeah. Um, so this spectrum just assumes that you have a direct spectrum. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's all you, you're assuming here. And, and do you know anything about the behavior of alpha with? with no, well, you know this. I shouldn't even put this here. This is very. This is for fun mostly because you see it depends very strongly on exactly how accurate you measure this and how accurate somebody else is measuring that, and if you have the same value of the doping or not. So you're asking for a lot. <laughs> you know, I'm not so sure I'm that confident on our, on our measurements anyway. I don't know about somebody else, but for sure ours are not that good. So I, I would not take that too seriously. The only thing is it's not zero. That, that's, you know, that's a really important thing. It's a really strongly correlated system. And it's not, you know, 100 or 1,000, it's some tens or two tens. It's pretty strong. That's all we can say. That's really the take home message. Sorry, so yeah. I have another question. Yeah. Um, so there have been some other RFS results uh, reporting how the superconducting gap is different from the, the, su the, the pseudo gap. So basically, yeah. it, it's data that essentially looks like you're. To, to some extent, your your Fermi are uh, your your pseudo gap data where right. uh, so and there's also in addition been sort of Raman data. So I guess uh, what, sorry? some Raman data which argues okay. that the, the right. superconducting gap. Is I know this data. data right? right. So uh, are they can they be consistent with the the, the picture that you proposed? Or yes, I think they are consistent. Uh, the, in fact, it turns out that that data that you mentioned about. Um, the comparing our data to, to theirs. It, their, they, our data that they compare to theirs is not in the superconducting state. Oh, or did they compare superconducting data? I forgot. Anyway, uh, it could be just a very strong matrix element effect. I think it probably is. Because they're mixing the quasi-particle peaks. So we just see them. So we, we, we have such a geometry that the quasi-particle peaks near the antinode is very strong and the, and the node is very weak. Okay, because we looked for that. Uh, you can uh, you can change the rotation of the uh, you can rotate the sample by 45 degrees. You will see the quasi particle the, at the node strong, and the other one might be missing altogether. So I think it's just other than that, I think it's just uh, missing something because of matrix element. Okay. And, and the Raman data. And the Raman data, I don't know. I'm not an expert in Raman. I I don't understand Raman. Um, the uh, the Raman experts, some of them tell me that they don't agree with that, but. What do I know? I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> that data is very, it's been around for a long time, so it's not new, but I don't know. Okay. So, in, in the ARPIS, the data, at least with BISCO, is fairly consistent from really the same. It's just interpretation. Right. Yeah? Uh, please, can you see in the antiferromagnetic state the lower power band? Or if you, if you measure the well, electronic excitation? I have not measured. Other people have. Uh, for example, Shen has measured the oxychloride undol, and then you can see the lower power band. Yes. And do you know if there is that? How does it look the gap as you approach ferromagnetism? They have actually yeah. measured that also. So apparently, some I forgot exactly. I think well, here's where surface effects can become uh, a problem because. Sometimes you get a new state appearing in the gap, okay? And sometimes you get that the chemical potential shifts. In LASCO, for example, the chemical potential shifts. In, in, in uh, the oxychloride, which I trust more because it's very similar to this, you see new states appearing in the gap. Okay. I think that's probably correct, I would guess, but you know, I don't know. Thank you. 
I didn't measure that. Yeah, I have one, since you still have a long time. Um, you never discussed the controversy over whether the kink is a normalization due to problems or, or due to uh, electronic dissertations. Can you comment on this? I'm not so sure I can add anything to it. I mean, what can I say? Um, do you care? I mean, no, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, you know, the note is a note. I don't know. It's a, it's a high energy. so. What can I tell you? No, it's presumably a very irrelevant question because, because it is a relevant question. If the normalization of the Fermi surface are driven by lattice excitations, yes. it's a very different picture to one which they're driven by magnetic excitations. Correct. Or, Correct. So, it's, Correct. It's, uh, so I do care. But there's no way that we can tell other than, well, what Chen did, I think, or, or Lanzar, somebody uh, did an experiment where they changed the isotope. And they see that this pink energy shifts a few millivolts, three millivolts or something. Okay. Okay, so that will indicate that there is some influence from the photon. Um, there was a prediction long before this controversy by Paramecanti et al., where they, you know, you know this projected wave function thing, right? Uh, so for everybody else, it's just uh, taking the, the, the wave function proposed by by uh, Anderson in his first paper, long before anybody even knew the structure of the high TC, he proposed a wave function in his first science paper. If you take that and then do some things to it, then you can calculate many things. So they actually predicted that the stronger normalization near the Fermi energy is different than at high energies. They actually predicted, in fact, that the velocity is constant with doping. You can actually, it's just a number that you can just calculate and it's correct. So, which one is correct? I, I, there must be phonon effects, okay? Everything has a phonon, you can hear it, right? So the question is, how much are they playing a role? I'm not so sure, you, well, I, I don't know the answer, I'm sorry. I don't wanna say something I don't, I don't know. Okay. It's probably, uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's strong correlations or phonons, that's what I mean, you, I'm, not, I'm not so sure you can separate. I don't think the kink at the node is magnetic. I, I think, although we said that in our paper, I don't think that's correct. Okay. But whatever happens at the antinode is definitely magnetic. That I can, well, you, you can see that quantitative comparison to, to a neutron scattering, for example. Quantitative. Okay. Elisa has a couple of announcements. Yes, sorry. Okay. Well, before now, let's thank Chelsea. The question is that uh, some of you have been asking to make a, a tour in the lab, so I decided to take five minutes to tell you something.